Good morning again. How are you guys after worship? Good time of worship? Amen. So today, this morning, we're going to be in 2 Kings chapter 13, verses 14 through 19. But before we jump in, I just want to say what a joy it was to see so many of you guys at the fellowship dinner. How many of you guys were there? Yeah. And so we encourage you guys to come out on Wednesday nights. We're going to have discipleship groups, and hopefully we're going to have some more fellowship dinners. So come on out and join us. And let's give Mike and Linda a round of applause for what they did. Thank you, guys. I was just thinking about a verse that ties in with that night of fellowship. And Acts 2.46 came to my mind. It says, they worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. And then verse 47 says, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. So I want to see that here, you know. I want to see people added to this fellowship because they see our love for one another and our love for God. Amen? Amen. So, as Kevin said, I have some jokes. But, yeah, they're not as good as Kevin's. So you guys can just give a courtesy laugh every once in a while. <laughs> but there, our text is about arrows, so I just looked up some archery jokes. So the, it's like a Q and A joke. So what did the archer get when he hit a bullseye? Any guesses? No? A very, very angry bull. <laughs> what do real archers say to compound archers? Probably a lot of you don't even know what a compound bow is, so. <laughs> but the men will get it. They say, I, I see you still have your training wheels on your bow. <laughs> what did the archer say when he nearly got shot at an archery contest? Any guesses? Nope. Wow, that was an arrow escape. Get it? A narrow <laughs> escape? Kevin's giving me a bad face. <laughs> Kevin doesn't like these. All right, here's the story. A duke was hunting in the forest with his men at arms and his servants. He came across a tree. Upon it, archery targets were painted, and smack in the middle of each target was an arrow. Who is this incredibly fine archer, cried the duke. I must find him. After continuing through the forest for a few miles, he came across a small boy carrying a bow and arrow. Eventually, the boy admitted that it was he who shot the arrows into the tree. You didn't just walk up to the targets and hammer the arrows into the middle, did you? asked, asked the duke. No, I shot them from 50 paces. I swear by it. That's truly astonishing, said the duke. I hereby admit you into my service. The boy thanked him profusely. But I must ask one favor in return, the duke continued. You must tell me how you came to be such an outstanding shot. Well, said the boy, first I fire the arrow at the tree, and then I paint the target around it. <laughs> you guys get it? All right, let's pray before we get into today's message. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you for joy, God. Thank you for jokes. Thank you that we can have fun. Thank you that we can have this time of fellowship with our brothers and sisters, and most of all with you, God. I pray that you would just anoint my tongue right now, that you would give me the words to say, to say to your people, and that their hearts would be open, God, to take in every word that you want them to take in, and that that seed that's planted in their hearts today would grow, and grow into a mighty tree. I just pray, Father, that you would help our minds to be off anything of this world, off any, if there's any shame in this place, I just pray that you'll take it away, that we can turn to you right now and look to all that you've done, all that you've done to bring us here, God, and to give us life. And so we thank you for that. And we bless your holy name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So the title of today's message is The Arrows of Freedom. Say that with me. The Arrows of Freedom. And so you guys are going to be repeating a lot of things, so... Just be ready. Stay awake. So we'll be in 2 Kings 13, 14, as I said. So starting in verse 14. Elisha had become sick with an illness of which he would die. Then Joash, the king of Israel, came down to him and wept over his face and said, Oh, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and their horsemen. Verse 15. And Elisha said to him, Take a bow and some arrows. So he took himself a bow and some arrows. Verse 16, then he said to the king of Israel, put your hand on the bow. 
So he put his hand on it, and Elisha put his hands on the king's hands. Verse 17, and he said, open the east window, and he opened it. And Elisha said, shoot, and he shot. And he said, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from Syria. For you must strike the Syrians at Aphek till you have destroyed them. Verse 18. Then he said, take the arrows. So he took them. And he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground. So he struck three times and then he stopped. Verse 19. And the man of God was angry with him and said, you should have struck five or six times. Then you have struck Syria till you have destroyed it. But now you will strike Syria only three times. So when I, when I thought back on when I was going to be giving my sermon, I realized that the next day was going to be the 4th of July. Trinity's in her beautiful 4th of July dress. And so I realized how that related to my message of freedom because we're talking about the arrows of freedom. And in the text, we see that the Israelites, they want to be delivered from the Syrians. You know, the Syrians were oppressing them. They were coming against them and trying to battle them all the time. And tomorrow, our country celebrates freedom from the oppression of England. And in our lives, right now, we want to be freed from the oppression of Satan's kingdom, right? So wherever there's oppression, wherever you see it, you, see, you hear cries of freedom being heard. So many people are oppressed in the world today. That could be mentally, physically, spiritually, or emotionally. There's so many different ways the devil tries to oppress us, tries to trap our minds, and tries to get our heads locked on all these lies. So the only yoke, that, the only burden that is light and that frees us from all these oppressions is Jesus' yoke, the one from the Lord Most High. So before we get into the text, I want to kind of explain who Joash is, if you guys don't know, because it, it makes you... Read the text in a different light if you know who he is, and then who Elisha is as well. So if you don't know about King Joash, you can read about him. Uh, I, I put, there's going to be verses. It's going to be 2 Chronicles 22.10 through 24.27. And those verses is where it talks about Joash. So you guys can write those down and read about him later. But here's a short account of his life. When he was a baby, he had a ruthless grandmother named Athaliah who tried to kill him in order to take the throne. I'm glad my grandma wasn't like that. <laughs> but in turn, he was taken to the temple of the Lord by this faithful prophet, this faithful priest named Jehoiada. Can you say that with me? Jehoiada. Jehoiada. Yeah, so this faithful prophet took him in, and he taught him the law for six years. And then at age seven, he became king. If you, if you yeah, seven, you guys are like, what? But... That's why he had the faithful priest, Jehoiada, because you could imagine being seven and leading a whole kingdom and making decisions about life and death. That would be pretty tough. But when Jehoiada was a priest and Joash was a king, they made a covenant with God's people, and they showed it by destroying the temple of Baal and even by taking out the pagan priest. Joash was even so passionate about the Lord's work that he wanted to restore the temple, so the people were procrastinating on doing that, so he kind of got angry, and he raised all this money, and a few days later, the temple was rebuilt. So it sounds like a pretty noble beginning, right? But once Joash died, no, once Jehoiada died, Joash's reign took a hard downward fall, and it, it's sad from here. He forsook the house of God, and he started listening to the counsel of the ungodly. <clears throat> So he forgot the law of his youth. He forgot what Jehoiada had taught him. And he started worshiping other gods and listening to ungodly counsel. And so if we look at Joash's life, it's clear that our faith should not just be our parents' conviction or you know, our pastor's conviction. It needs to be our faith. It needs to be what we believe. The other day, I came across what I said at my graduation ceremony. And it was an encouragement to the graduating class to make their faith their own, to have it as their own conviction. Because I don't know if you guys have heard the stats, but something like 85% of college students fall away from the Lord within the first year. And it's because it was their parents' belief. And once they're away from their parents, they fall away. And so if we don't want that for our lives, then we need to be men and women of God who study the word and who are able to make disciples and humbly say, follow me as I follow Christ, right? 
So the thing is that once you start making disciples, that's what really tests your faith. That's what really stretches you to study more. And, you know, if someone asks you a question, you can really take a look at your faith and see what you believe. But if you're not testing it, you could end up like Jehoiada or Joash. And so many J names. Joash, who started out as a good king, a king who was pleasing to the eyes of the Lord. But then the Bible says that he did evil in the Lord's sight. So we follow with our text today. Now we see that King Joash comes to Elisha. And so a little background on Elisha. How many of you guys know Elisha? Yeah, personally? No. <laughs> but he's the prophet that followed Elijah. And how I know the difference between them is my mom used to say that the one with the J, Elijah, he jumped to heaven because he didn't die. He was taken up in a chariot of fire in a whirlwind. That would be a fun way to go, huh? So in 2 Kings 2, we see Elijah pray a double portion of his spirit on Elisha. And we see him have a long and fruitful ministry for almost 60 years. So this time, Elisha experienced a lot, and he's, see, he's seeing kings come and go. He's seeing empires fall, and when Elijah was taken up to heaven, he saw that, and now he's on his deathbed, and he knows that his time to depart is near. But before he departs, we see that King Joash pays him a visit. As we just saw, God's assessment of this king is not good at all. The Bible says that he did evil in the sight of the Lord. And if we didn't know this information before we read this text, we would read it in a different light. So we wonder, why did King Joash come to Elisha? Why did he say, my father, my father, when he was such an evil guy and Elisha was a righteous man? Why did he come to, so far to hear from him? The answer is that King Joash believed in many gods. Do you guys know anyone who believes in a bunch of religions? Yeah, some of you. Yeah, he just wanted to cover all the bases. He wanted to be a part of this religion to make, his, make sure he's good here, and then be a part of that religion, and then be a part of Christianity. And so he was trying to cover all the bases to make sure that he wasn't missing anything. But that's not how we should do it, right? So he was a polytheist, which meant he worshipped many gods. Israel, they had a different religion, though. And it could be summed up as this, one God who does all. So that's what we believe, right? The truth is that there is only one God. He is the God of all. We can try to make our own gods. We can try to bring, put up idols before him. But God says to only serve him. And his sovereignty extends over all creation. So even though Joash was a pagan, now we see him coming to this man of God named Elisha. He didn't see him as a public enemy like Ahab and Jezebel did with previous prophets. You know, Jezebel and Ahab, they're really mean to prophets, but this king, Joash, was quite nice to Elisha. He probably had seen God move through Elisha before, so he knew that, you know, I can get some power out of him. I can go to him, and he'll help me out so that we don't, we're not defeated. I think he comes to Elisha just for that, just to get something from him. So our first point for today is come to God yourself. Say that with me. Come to God yourself. So the problem with our culture is that we act like Joash. We have all these other gods. We have all these other idols that we put first. And it's not until we have an enemy coming up against us that we turn to God. But it shouldn't be like that. We're not polytheists like Joash. We believe in one God who's in control of everything. And that if that's true, then he should be our everything, right? If we believe he's sovereign over all, then he should be our all in all. So he's not just the God of the battle. Joash and people of his time, they believed that there is a God of the hills, God of the valleys, God of your work. There's so many different gods for everything. But our God is God of all. He created it all. He knows every part of us. And that's why he's worthy of all our worship. Amen? amen. And nothing else deserves his praise. So if we say amen, a lot of times we say amen, but then we... We do what Joash does. We come to him only in the hard times. And it shows us how selfish we are at times. We spend time with God only if, you know, we see a battle coming like Joash. If we see the Syrian army coming at us. But 
I want you guys to, this week or maybe after service, if you can, just go alone with God. Ask Him if there's any idols that you've put before Him. Ask Him if you've only come to Him just when the battle comes. You know, ask, how do I respond when something bad happens? How do I respond when something good happens? And what do I think about most of the day? I guarantee you, if you start asking the Lord, and if you give Him time, if you listen to Him, He'll tell you. So Joash had Elisha as some type of security blanket. Have you seen those babies, you know, little kids with security blankets? They're, they're hold it, they hold it, and like, if they're scared, they can put it over their head. Yeah, so that's what Joash was doing with Elisha. He was afraid that he was going to leave because he knew that he had the power and he didn't want him to leave or else his army would lose. So too many of us Christians, we act like babies. We find security in people who hear from God. It's great to have pastors and leaders, but if we're, we shouldn't always be relying on them for our spiritual growth, right? We should be able to learn. Like, as a baby Christian, it's good to have that, right? It's good to have guidance because you don't know a lot. But as you get older and more mature in Christ, we're supposed to come to him first, even before we go to counselors. And it's great to have wise counselors, so don't say that. So still come to church. (laughs) It's still good to come here and to hear from God here as well. But we need to go to him first. So we need to grow up as babies. We drink milk, right? And as adults, we start eating meat. And it's the same way with the baby Christian. At first, people bring them the food and the water of the word. But then later on, they start to learn how to find that food, how to find that water in the word of God. And then they start to learn how to teach others how to find it. So when Joash came to Elisha, you may have thought that his tears were of love and sorrow because he was about to lose a good friend. But they weren't those type of tears. The tears were prompted out of fear of losing his point of contact with God. So he treated him just as a point of contact with God. They're selfish tears, ones that con- were concerned for himself and his kingdom. Second Kings 13 just told us how Israel's forces had been reduced, and now Syria is coming at them. So this puts him in fear in two different spots, and he doesn't want to lose that contact with God. So our second point here is to grow up. Say grow up. Grow up. Tell your... Tell the person right next to you, grow up. <laughs> that was a little quiet. Are you afraid? <laughs> so has anyone heard these words before? Nope, no one? Well, I have. <laughs> Kevin has. So we all have probably heard this, these words at one point or another. But as Christians, we should always be growing. We should be growing out of some things, but we should also be growing in some things that we had at the beginning of our faith. We should be growing in the zeal that we had as a baby Christian and the faith that we had also. But now, as we grow in that zeal, we need to be adding knowledge. So everything should be increasing. All the good traits should be increasing as we get to know the Lord more. If you look at the end of verse 14, you'll see that Joash basically repeats what Elisha said to Elijah at the time he was taken up into heaven. He says, Oh, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and the horsemen, so this is first mentioned in 2 Kings 2, 11 through 12, which says, Then it happened, as they continued on and talked, that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up, with, went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Verse 12, And Elijah saw it, and he cried out, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. So he saw him no more, and he took hold of his own clothes and tore them into two pieces. And then in 2 Kings 6, just a couple of chapters later, we see he says, And when the servant of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? Verse 16, So he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Verse 17, And Elisha prayed, and he said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Could you just imagine that? Horses and chariots, you know, 
Elisha tells you to see, and you see all these people on your side, and you know you have confidence that you're going to win. And that's true for us today. You know, Satan, he only took one-third of the angels. So we have two angels for every demonic angel. Amen? Amen. So there's more for us than for, against us. So here in this phrase, Joash, he could seem like he's saying, Elijah, you're about to be taken up into heaven like your predecessor, Elijah, and you're about to have a heavenly escort into heaven. But no, from what we hear here, <laughs> hear, here, Joash, he seems to be saying, Oh no, Elisha, you're about to die. And that means I will lose access to the heavenly army and horsemen of chariots of fire. Some people may say that Joash was heartbroken, but I think he was heartbroken more for himself because he recognized that these forces were only around when Elisha was around. So next we come to verses 15 through 17. So I want to read those to refresh your memory. So... It says, And Elisha said to him, Take a bow and some arrows. So he took himself a bow and some arrows. Verse 16, Then he said to the king of Israel, Put your hand on the bow. So he put his hand on it, and Elisha put his hands on the king's hands. And he said, Open the east window. And he opened it. Then Elisha said, Shoot. And he shot. And he said, The arrow of the Lord's deliverance, and the arrow of the deliverance from Syria. For you must strike the Syrians at Aphek till you have destroyed them. So Joash believes that once you know, Elisha is gone, Israel's security will be gone as well. But right here, Elisha is going to show him an illustration that shows him that he's wrong. Because even though Elisha would be gone, there would be something that still remains. And we'll get to that in a few moments, so hang on. But... Imagine Elisha. He's on his deathbed. He's terminally ill. Imagine if he was here with us today. He would probably be in an intensive care unit hooked up to all these machines and stuff. But he summons the king, and it sounds like he even sits up to put his hands on the king, king's hands as he shoots the bow. And it's interesting. He says, open the east window and shoot the arrow. And that arrow there is a symbol of war because the initial battles between Israel and and Syria were fought in Ramoth Gilead, which was east of where they were. So the bow and the arrow in the hands of Joash and Elisha were to symbolize Israel's prophetic victory over Syria. How many need a prophetic victory at times? I think we all do. Amen? And that's why I think that song, No Longer Slaves to Fear, is so powerful. Because, you know, we all are slaves to fear at some time. We all have been. And so it's just proclaiming declaring, you know, it's that prophetic victory over fear. So even though Elisha would depart from the earth, the heir of the Lord's deliverance would still be present. And Joash, all he had to do was shoot the arrow of faith. So our third point for today is shoot the arrow of faith. Say that with me. Shoot the arrow of faith. One more time. Shoot the arrow of faith. So once we shoot the arrow of faith, we come to more arrows, which are found in verses 18 and 19. This is where it really gets interesting. So in verse 18, it says, Then he said, Take the arrows. So he took them. And he said to the king of Israel, Strike the ground. So he struck the ground three times and stopped. Verse 19, And the man of God was angry with him and said, You should have struck five or six times. Then you have struck Syria till you have destroyed it. But now you will, only strike, you will strike Syria only three times. So, you think that Elisha would be done with the first arrow, right? But, no, he, God is developing Joash. So, Elisha tells him to pick up some more arrows and to strike them on the ground. Some people think that striking on the ground, it doesn't really mean striking. Some people think it actually means shooting the ground. But, at first I thought it just meant striking. But, it seems like it could be shooting the ground because the first one he shot... And then it sounds like he grabs a few more, so maybe five or six, and he only shoots three of them, and Elisha gets mad. So I could be totally wrong there, and that, that doesn't make a huge difference in the text. But imagine that he shot the first arrow, okay? So he shot the first one out of the eastern window, and then he did the same with three more arrows, except he shot them into the ground. As soon as Joash stops shooting, we see the man of God get angry with him. And you think, can men of God get really angry? <laughs> yeah, they can. There's a righteous anger. But we don't have to talk about that right now. 
Elisha proclaims, you should have struck five or six times. Then you have struck Syria till you had destroyed it. But now you'll strike Syria only three times. So why does he get so mad? Well, from the first arrow shot, Elisha made it clear that there is a connection between the arrow being shot and the Syrians being struck, which would bring deliverance to Israel. So we fully expected Joash to realize this, to understand this, that when you shoot the, the gesture of shooting the arrow is actually striking Syria. But he didn't get this, I guess. Many things could have caused Joash to quit. I think he probably just quit because he sees this guy on his deathbed, you know, and he doesn't really have the faith. He's not really known for being a man of faith in the Bible, so I think his faith could have been weak right then. But that brings us into a good point. Instead of quitting before we see results, we need to keep on pressing in with fervency, right? Amen. How many, you know, if, if we quit in everything we did, a lot of us would be nowhere, right? Oh. And, yeah, and so, like, even with a diet, you know, it's hard for people. They start something, they don't see the results the next day, so they quit. And that's not how we should be. So our fourth point for today is to be zealous. Say that with me. Be zealous. Of course, we know that with zeal, we need knowledge, right? And we need that knowledge to direct that passion for the things of God. But as long as you're doing the Lord's will, just go all out. I encourage you to go all out until maybe he tells you to stop. Just listen to him, but give it all your heart, all your passion, all your fervency. Be eager to do the Lord's will. We need to constantly be shooting these arrows of deliverance over our lives as well as the lives of others others because you see Joash he was shooting this over the lives of all the Israelites so it affected all of them when Elisha says to strike the ground he's asking Joash to do something which resembles prayer and so we're gonna have five arrows for today and the first arrow is prayer so that's the first and most important arrow that we have so write that down prayer it's the first one we should pull out of our quiver because this man of God said this, there is more that we can do than pray, but we can't do anything until we first pray. Let me read that again. There is more we can do than pray, but we can't do anything until we first pray. So Elisha's kind of telling him to strike the ground, kind of like prayer, you know, keep going. You keep praying. Like, just like prayer, shooting the arrows requires our effort and aim. Like, he had to aim through that, through that window, right? A lot of people just throw up random prayers, though. So maybe we just throw up one and then give up. Or maybe we throw up three more, like Joash, and then give up. But the Lord says to keep going. We might not even know where we're shooting, but that's why we need a man or woman of God. Or we need God himself to direct us, to tell us where to aim. If I'm aiming through that window, God will tell me to aim through that window. We, won't, we might not even know what it symbolizes yet, what it really means, but we just got to listen to his voice. In prayer, many of us shoot one arrow and then give up, like I said before. But the point that I want to make so clear is not to give up in prayer. Get on your knees. Pray till something changes, till something happens. And if it's not working, ask the Lord. Say, am I aiming in the right place? And if he says yes, then keep going. Remember, I think... I didn't write down, but I think Daniel, he was fasting for like 22 days. Imagine if he, he was praying and fasting. Imagine if he stopped the 20th day. He wouldn't see breakthrough. And so we need to keep on going till we see breakthrough. We need to be men and women who pray in faith because otherwise we can end up hurting other people. Because of Joash's lack of confidence, he limited the number of times that he struck the ground which meant that he limited the number of times Israel would defeat Syria. So Israel's relief from Syrian oppression could have lasted much, much longer. It could have been thorough, but instead it was only partial because he only, he partially, he gave half his heart to it. So too often we do that too. We, that's why I brought up this text, because I was reading in the one-year Bible a couple days ago, and I realized that a lot of times, I'm that man. I'm the one who just taps the arrows a few times and then gives up. But we need to go all out, just smash those arrows over our unbelief. 
Look at Elijah, the one with the J. He was a powerful man because he was a man of prayer. James 5 says this about him. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And verse 17 says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. That's encouraging, right? And it says, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. So that's the difference. He prayed earnestly. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And verse 18, and he prayed again. And the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced his fruit. So he was just like a man like you and me, a man or woman of God. But yet he had that fervency in prayer. That goes along with our fourth point, which was be zealous. He was so zealous that he put his head between his knees, and he prayed not once, not twice, but he prayed seven times in this intense posture of prayer. So this posture back then, it was actually the, the way people gave birth. So, so commentators say that he was actually birthing something in prayer. And I know, guys, we haven't had babies, but <laughs> women, if you know, it takes work to have a baby, right? It takes time, and you can't give up. So that's how we need to be in prayer. We need to keep pushing, keep giving all that fervency, all that effort, until we see something birth through Christ. I long to be like that man, like Elisha and Elijah, and like that man in uh, Genesis 32. You know, Jacob, where it talks about him wrestling with the Lord, he would not give up. He said, I will not let you go until you bless me. Just think about that passion to wrestle with the Lord all night and not to give up until, you know, he touched his hip. So we need to have that fervor, that passion that will not give up until we see something happen. That's the kind of prayer that moves the hand of God. Amen? Amen. So now we come to our second arrow, which is the word of God. Remember when Jesus was doing battle with Satan in Matthew 4? You know, he was fasting and Satan was trying to tempt him. Each time Satan came to him with something, Jesus responded with scripture. It reminds me of this movie series called Bible Man. Has anyone heard of that? It's kind of old. Yeah. I don't know if it's still around today. But, you know, Bible Man, he had a lightsaber, and bad guys would come at him. And they would say discouraging things or try to tempt him or something. And then a Bible Man would come at him with the scripture, and he... You know, they're actually fighting with lightsabers as, as they're doing that. So it was a good picture to me as I was a kid to see how Jesus did that with Satan. The word of God is a powerful weapon that we have to fight the enemy, right? Just think about it. The enemy can oppress and depress us so easily with lies if we do not know the truth of God's word. That's why we must really learn to use this arrow wisely. Instead of waking up and saying, let's see, I might have time for a devotional. And then you're like, what should I read? And then you, you try to figure out what you, to read for that time. And then you're like, oops, time's up. And you just tap your arrow once or twice and then leave. A lot of us do that. And that won't get you anywhere. Elisha would say to take that arrow and beat it on the ground. Memorize those scriptures. Let them sink deep into your heart. And when the enemy comes to you with lies, you can show yourself approved. You can... Counter, counteract or something, you know, you can take those lies and you can give the truth to them so that they don't, they don't affect you, so that they don't trap your mind. So if you keep that arrow hidden, you know, if we keep the arrow of the word of God hidden, then it's no wonder that our deliverance won't be complete. Nothing should have higher priority than studying this book. If you study the word of God, you will see a continual pattern of growth and victory in your life. So that brings us to our third arrow, which is the word of faith. Say that with me. The word of faith. So too many times we talk negatively, right? We go around saying why we're discouraged or why we're upset in life, and all these negative attitudes affects us. So Matthew 17, 20 says, To say to that mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing says nothing will be impossible for you. So whatever is standing in front of you, what's standing between you and your victory, your deliverance? Whatever it is, speak to it, shout at it, and release that word of faith in that situation. Don't talk negatively. Don't give excuses like Joash might have been thinking. But if deliverance 
is real, then we must, you know, give all our faith. We shouldn't be like Joash and say, well, this man of God, he's dying, so if, why isn't deliverance real for him? Well, it was his time to go, you know? And so deliverance is real. We need to just put faith in every situation. So speak the word of faith. Shoot that arrow to the ground and believe for your deliverance. Have you guys seen that movie, War Room? Yeah, the new movie? Yeah, remember when the wife, she was in, she was in her house and she was just commanding you know, Satan to be gone? And she was saying, like, I'm not going to settle for this destruction in my life, in my marriage, in my family. So wherever you have to go, if you have to go in your car, in your house, in your closet, just, just command that thing to go. Command that discouragement, that destruction that the enemy's trying to use against you to go. So that brings us into our fourth arrow. Our fourth arrow is praise. Say that with me. Praise. praise. So you could be so discouraged by your enemies, right? You could be so discouraged by the things of this world. But I like the psalm uh, where Asaph in Psalm 73 says that once he entered the house of the Lord, he understood that the destruction awaited his en- enemies. And so he wasn't afraid or sad or depressed anymore when he entered the house of the Lord with praise. Second Chronicles 20 talks about an army that sang, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endures forever. And once they sang this, once they raised up one voice, the army that they were fighting was so caught off guard that they began to slay each other. So all Israel had to do was walk up in there and take the spoils because all the job was done through praise. So we are to enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. So that that spirit of heaviness, has anyone felt that spirit of heaviness? Yeah, I think we all have. We come in like this, and you can sense it on people. You can see it. But we, we need to come into the house of God so that that spirit of heaviness is cast off and so that we could put on the, the garment of praise, right? So there's so much power in praise. So don't just go through a couple of songs. Don't just go through a couple of songs just tapping your arrow and thinking that's good. But do it wholeheartedly, not half-heartedly. Put on the garment of praise and strike those arrows triumphantly. So that takes us to our last arrow. And as it's Communion Sunday, I thought it would be appropriate to end with the last arrow of communion. So when we take communion, you know, it's, it's sad that we see that some people are bored with it, you know. Paul says in verse in uh, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty nine, 29, that many are weak and sick and may, many sleep because they do not value the table of the Lord. And remember what my dad says. He says that sleep, that means that many are even, many are even dying because they don't take it seriously. So we're to take it seriously. How many of you guys, never mind. <laughs> Trick question. So, Remember when it says to sleep, we, gotta, we really got to put all our passion and all our effort into turning away from our sins and to ask for, for, for that forgiveness before we come into the time of communion because it is a serious time. So as we enter into this time of communion today, I encourage you guys to come to the Lord's table. Come to it expecting God's grace, expecting his forgiveness to rain down upon you. Because remember, he says, if you confess your sins, you'll be saved and turn to him. So some of you may feel like Joash. Some of you may feel unworthy. Some of you may feel unconvinced. You may be unsure that deliverance is real. But I assure you that you'll find freedom from sin, and you'll find freedom from the power of the enemy if you put, you take those arrows that the Lord has given you, these five arrows. There's probably more. But these five that I showed you guys today, take those and smash them over your unbelief. But the question is, do we want it? Just think about that. Do, do I really want that? Do I want to be delivered? Because you have to want it. Because sadly, I see a lot of people not want deliverance. They want to stay in bondage. They want to do it for some type of sympathy. And that's just wrong, right? Wrong, right? <laughs> so as Christians... We're to be men and women who are free to do the will of God. We're not to be people who are rendered useless by the enemy's schemes. So we shouldn't talk negatively and feel depressed all the time. 
So if you feel unworthy, I encourage you guys during this time of communion to come to him and say, I feel unworthy, Lord, but I have faith that you have made me worthy, that you have covered my sin, that you've washed me of all unrighteousness. So we come to you right now. So remember this one last thing, that deliverance, it doesn't depend on you. It doesn't depend on who you are or who you were in the past. It depends on God, and he's faithful, and he's good to us at all times. So if it depends on him, you know that he wants you to be free, right? And so if it depends on him, then we can take those arrows triumphantly and strike them on the ground. So let's pray before we enter this time of communion. Would you bow your heads with me? Dearly Father, I just thank you, God, that you've given us these arrows of freedom, of deliverance, God. You gave us songs of deliverance. I pray that we would just let these arrows fly, God. Let them fly over our unbelief. Let them be struck down to the ground wherever that unbelief or that mountain is stopping us from freedom. I pray, God, that you would show us where to aim, that you would show us how to use these arrows and how to be wise, God. We just thank you for this time that we get to enter into communion. I pray that you would help us, God, to to truly lay everything before you right now, that we would not be hiding anything because you see it all anyway, and that we would just lay it down at your feet and ask you to take those things away that have hurt you, take those things away that we've used to, to put you on the cross, God. We just ask that you cleanse us and wash us right now, We turn to you, and we thank you, God, that you've done this great work, that you have, you died and you rose again for us, and we thank you for that with all our hearts, God. It's in Jesus' name I pray.